Okay, let's begin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zina ilman ya Rabbil Alameen. Alright, we continue with the uh, class on sincerity and intention. Just uh, very quickly to go back a few hadiths we took last time. We took three hadiths. Uh, hadith number three. لا هجرة بعد الفتح ولكن جهاد ونية وإذا سنفرتم فنفروا. There is no immigration after the conquest of Mecca, but only jihad and good intention. Uh, Alright, so we talked about the uh, fath of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca in the eighth year after Hijrah. Warning of the Quran for those who did not do Hijrah because this was mandatory. It was mandatory to do Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. Uh, verse of the Quran which uh, emphasizes that. Prophecy in this hadith, which is that Mecca will remain Darul Islam. Uh, hijrah is no more to Mecca. There's no more Hijrah to Mecca, but this concept of Hijrah still exists if there is a need. If there is a, ever comes a situation where Muslims are unable to practice their religion in a certain land, then you can migrate to a different land, and that will be a type of Hijrah, which you will be rewarded for, inshallah. So there's no more Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. But Rasulullah said there remains jihad and niyyah, meaning you can still get reward. There are other paths of reward. Uh, even though this path has closed, there are still other paths of reward. Hadith number four, uh, the hadith in which uh, Jabir says that we accompanied the Prophet uh, in the battle of Tabuk. And he said that even though we are taking part in this battle, there are some men in Medina who are, are with you wherever you march, where, whichever value you cross. They have not joined you in person, but they were with you in spirit. Uh, because they had reasons that uh, allowed them to stay back. Illness or whatever uh, other legitimate reason. <clears throat> so they still get the reward. Those people who did not, uh, even though they didn't take part take in the battle, and they stayed back, but they still get the same reward because they had the intention of going, and they had a legitimate excuse of not uh, being able to go. All right, uh, so we talked about the, the category of people who remained behind in the battle of Tabuk. All right, those who had no means to go, those who were too sick or weak, those uh, who were hypocrites, and then you had sincere believers who, d who didn't have any excuse. All right, so we said that you can still obtain rewards even if you don't do an action. If, as long as you have that sincere intention, uh, then you, you can still get the rewards for it. An example of that is the slave who falls ill or is traveling. He still gets the reward of the voluntary actions he does when, uh, that he used to do when he's at home in good health. Right, we talked about the example of Uthman ibn Affan who was regarded as participating in the Battle of Badr. Even though he missed the Battle of Badr, he's still regarded as a participant because he missed the battle with a valid excuse. So he still gets that reward and he's still considered to be amongst those who participated in the Battle of Badr. All right, and we mentioned the, the hadith of a person who's given uh, wealth, knowledge and wealth, and they spend it uh, according to uh, how Allah likes it to be spent. And then a person is given, uh, another person is given knowledge but not given wealth. And this person has that intention that he, if he was given wealth, he would do the same thing that the other person did. So he gets that same reward. There will be equal reward. And on the other hand, a person, Allah gives wealth, but he does not give knowledge. That person squanders their wealth. They squander their wealth. And then another person, Allah has given no knowledge, no wealth. But he wishes to be like the one who's given wealth but did not spend it properly. And so Rasulullah says that they are equal in sin. Right, because he had that intention of if he was to give that, given that wealth, he would squander it and spend it in an awful way. All right, we also uh, mentioned hadith of uh, Ma'an Ma ibn Yazid who uh, reported that his father gave some charity to a man to distribute in the masjid. So then his, the son comes and takes that charity that was intended for anybody else to take. So the father did not intend for the son to take the charity. But nonetheless, the son came and took the charity. So they went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi told them, he said that you will have, the, O Yazid, the, the father, you have the reward because you intended to give charity. So you have that reward of charity. And he said to the son, O Ma'an, that you will, you're entitled to take that wealth or that money that was given in charity, even though it was not, the, your father did not intend for you to have it, but uh, it is still lawful for you to take. All right, we talked about who is a Sahabi, a person who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during his life while believing in him, even if for a moment, and died on Iman. This is the definition of a Sahabi, companion. Uh, permissibly, if taken the father to court, this is not considered to be disobedience. 
permissibly of delegating certain actions. So you can give somebody to distribute your sadaqah, distribute your zakat. Uh, your, somebody could do your qurbani for you, or paying your debt for you. All this is permissible. You don't have to do these things on your own. Uh, but there's certain actions that you have to do on your own. Like salah, you have to do on your own. You can't delegate somebody to pray on your behalf. Uh, fasting, as long as you're alive, you cannot delegate somebody to fast on your behalf. You have to fast. After you die, that's a different story. Scholars have differed whether a person can fast on, on behalf of somebody who passed away and they owe fast. But once you're alive, then you cannot delegate something like that. All right, the reward of sadaqah is based on intention. Even if a person, the recipient was not intended, you still get the reward of the sadaqah. All right, uh, hadith number six is a long hadith uh, of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, uh, where he wanted to, uh, he wanted to donate uh, his money, or a large portion of his money, because he thought he was dying. He thought he was in his deathbed. And Rasulullah told him that um, only a third, right? only a third you can donate on your deathbed. So if you're, you're, and you're, you're dying on your deathbed, then the most you can give is a third of your, your wealth. Anything more than that is not allowed. And this was during the, the farewell hajj of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, in this, in this hadith, he, you know, he mentioned his illness. And he talked about his illness. And he was uh, not necessarily complaining, but he was mentioning it. And it's permissible to mention your illness if there's a reason. All right, so if, if you need to receive treatment, then you can you know, tell the doctor, I'm experiencing such and such symptoms, and this is allowed. Or if you want somebody to make dua for you, I'm in pain, all right, um, then please make dua for me. You can mention your illness and your sickness. All right, if you want to give a bequest or you're asking for a fatwa, then you could, on all these situations, you can mention your illness and there's no problem with that. But if a person mentions their illness out of anger, frustration, this is where it is not allowed. All right, so if you're ill and then you mention uh, your illness or you're complaining about your illness because you are ang angry that Allah has made you uh, ill, then this is not allowed. All right, we also mentioned about the permissive of gaining gathering wealth. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas says that I'm a person who has a lot of wealth. So there's no problem in gathering wealth. Wealth is in itself not a problem. Uh, how you spend it is uh, where it could be lead to problems. But a person just gathering wealth, this is permissible. And we said many of the Sahaba, many of the senior Sahaba were wealthy individuals. So there's no problem in gathering wealth as long as the rights of the wealth are, uh, are given. Uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas in this hadith he said that uh, I only have one daughter and he said that this, the, the daughter will inherit one half of the estate right, if she's by herself if she doesn't have any brothers and sisters alright the importance of asking people of knowledge or he, said, or he said more than one third of the wealth is not allowed while on your deathbed Once you're, when you're alive and well you can, you can, you can give as much as you want right? you can give all your wealth away right? as we saw in uh, the hadith the, the same hadith uh, about the, uh, the events of Tabuk, when, when the, the Sahaba were coming and they were giving their wealth, fi sabilillah, Abu Bakr came and he, gave, he donated all of his wealth. And Rasulullah asked him, what did you leave back for your family? Abu Bakr said that I left them Allah and his messenger. So this shows it's permissible to don donate all your wealth if you want to. Omar came later on, he donated half his wealth. Or Omar, Omar came first actually. He came first, he donated half his wealth, and he said that Abu Bakr is not going to beat me this time. Then after, Abu Bakr came afterwards and donated all of his wealth. So this shows that it's permissible to don donate all your wealth. Uh, but uh, it's up to the individual. And sometimes it might be better to uh, keep the money for yourself. As the, we mentioned uh, the hadith of Ka'b ibn Malik, we mentioned that long hadith. After Allah forgave him, he uh, said to Rasulullah that I'm going to donate all of my wealth. And Rasulullah told him, no, keep it for your family. Right? So it depends on the person. Uh, but you, once you're alive and in health, you can donate as much as you want, but if you're on your deathbed, then you're only allowed to donate one-third. The most you're allowed to do is one-third of uh, a person's wealth. All right, and uh, the very, a very important part of this hadith is that Rasulullah told Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, it's better that you keep the wealth, don't donate it to others, keep it so that the, your family can inherit from you afterwards. It's better that you leave your family rich rather than you die, you pass away, and you have no, you're, they have no money to inherit from you, and then they are left begging and asking people after you die. All right, um, we want move on to hadith number seven. <clears throat> hadith number seven, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates that Rasulullah said, "Allah does not look at your bodies nor at your forms, but He looks at your hearts and deeds." In Allah Taala, la yanduru ila surikum wa amwalikum. 
or some hadith mentioned wa ajsadikum all right so some hadith mentioned your wealth uh, or and some hadith mentioned your bodies so allah does not look at your bodies or your forms or some narrates to mention allah does not look at your bodies or your wealth walakin inma yanzuru ila qurubikum wa a'malikum but he looks at your hearts and your deeds uh, this hadith basically means that the things that you have no control over all right how tall you are we have no control over that right what color skin you are we have no control over that all right these the, the natural way in which allah has created us which we have no control over then allah does not hold us to account for these things meaning that there's no reward or punishment based on these things all right what is reward or punishment based on your actions and what is in your heart but the the way allah created you then these things we have no control over and so because we have no control over them then allah does not look at these things in terms of reward or punishment all right so the meaning of hadith is basically reward and punishment is not determined based on bodily features that one has no control over so allah is the one who gave us the bodies that we that we that we are living inside as allah says in surah ali imran huwa alladhi yusawwirukum fil arham allah says that he's the one who shaped you and molded you in the, in the wombs of your mothers. He's the one who shaped you and molded you in the wombs of your mothers however he, however he wants and however he wishes. So we have no control over these things, how tall you are, what skin color you are, all right, uh, certain features of your body. Of course, there's some things that we can control to some degree. All right, a person can um, control their weight maybe to some degree or, and some other things they can control. But uh, many things uh, in the body we have no control over. So these things Allah does not look at them in terms of uh, reward and punishment but rather Allah looks at what is in the heart and he looks at your actions he looks at your actions uh, and we mentioned the verse it is he who forms you in the wombs however he wills there's no de deity except for him the exalted in might the wise so Allah does not look at your bodily features right? this has no impact in a person's status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have the, uh, an example in the hadith of uh, Ibn Mas'ud Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he was one of the senior Sahaba, uh, known for his uh, knowledge of the Quran, known for his fiqh, amongst other things. Right? He was amongst the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba, but he was actually also very uh, thin, very skinny. So one day he was climbing up a tree, and his shin became exposed. All right? His shin became exposed, and everybody saw how skinny he was, and they started to laugh at him. Right? Some of the other companions, they started to laugh. Like, right, look how skinny he is. His shins are. So Rasulullah Sallam heard them laughing and he asked them, Why are you guys laughing? And they said, You know, they're, you know his, his, his shins are very, uh, very tiny and skinny. So Rasulullah Sallam swore, he said, By, by the one who's, uh, whose hand belongs my soul, uh, the, his shin, fil mizan min jabili uhud. That they are, th these two shins, uh, the scales on the day of judgment, these shins are going to be weighing more than the mountain of uhud. Right, so it's not about the bodily features, but it's rather the hearts and actions. But Allah looks at your heart, what is in your hearts, and what is your actions, what, what actions you have done. So He does not look at your bodily features. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was very skinny, but that had no impact. In fact, Allah looked not at his bodily features, but rather his actions and his heart. And so Rasul Sallam said that his shins are equal or more than the Mount Uhud uh, in the scales on Yawm al -Qiyam. And we have the verse, the very well-known verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa says, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ That the most noble of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa is the most righteous of you. All right? So the most noble is not according to where you're from, what skin color you are, how tall you are. None of these things uh, matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The most noble of you is in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has the most taqwa, the most righteous. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at and He does not look at anything else. Alright, so therefore it's um, very important that we don't uh, get fooled by the outside. Sometimes the outside appearance can be deceiving. Right? The outside appearance can be deceiving. Uh, and what matters is what is in the heart. It doesn't mean though that the outside features don't matter, right? Especially certain things, the, the way Allah has commanded us to dress. Right? We cannot use this hadith to say that, well, uh, we, we don't have to worry about hijab anymore because 
Allah only looks at the uh, the hearts because Allah also says uh, or so some says in the, in the hadith and he looks at your actions as well so this is included as well the, the act he looks at your heart and your deeds right so you can't use this hadith to say well right, we, we could just just however we want do whatever we want no all right the hadith also mentions deeds as well so you can't use this hadith to say that you can dress however you want so Allah actually looks at your hearts and he looks at your deeds as well he looks at both but the out, what is on the outside can sometimes be deceiving all right, we have uh, also the, uh, the, the, the hadith of Usama ibn Zaid. Right, Usama ibn Zaid, they were in a battle one time. And uh, he was, there, was a, there was one of the disbelievers who was killing believers left and right. right? He was just defeating everybody he, he, he meets in the battle. In the battle. Right, so uh, Usama ibn Zaid finally corners this disbeliever. And he's about to kill him. Right? He overpowers him, he, beats, he defeats him in the, in the duel. And he's about to kill him. And this disbeliever says the shahada. He says, La ilaha illallah. So for Usama ibn Zaid, for him, the, 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 the situation is obvious, which is that he is saying the shahada for what reason? To save himself, right? That's what it seems like, that he's only saying the shahada to save himself. So he judges based on the parent, and he kills the guy. Right? He kills the, the, this disbeliever. Right? Later on, this comes to Rasulullah and Rasulullah got very upset very upset at Usama ibn Zaid. And he asked him, how could you kill him when he, when he said, La ilaha illallah. Right? And then Usama ibn Zaid responded, he said that, oh Rasulullah, he only said that because he wanted to save himself. All right? He didn't really mean it. He wasn't sincere in, in, his, in, in his saying this. He wasn't really a believer. He was just saying this to save himself. And Rasulullah said to him then, Hal la shaqaqta qalbahu. Did you open his heart and did you peer inside his heart and see what he was really believing inside and Rasulullah kept repeating this phrase did you open his heart and look inside of his heart or not and Usama ibn Zayd said that he kept on repeating this so many times that um, I wish that I had not become Muslim until that day right he wished that uh, I wish that I did not become Muslim until that day because he was you know so um, he felt so bad about uh, what he did and the way that Rasulullah responded to that all right so the outside you know the we don't. We can't judge some. Not always. We can uh, judge by the apparent, and it is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala who knows what is in the hearts. Right? Allah knows what is in the hearts. All right. So that's Hadith number seven. Any questions on that Hadith? Moving on. So Hadith number eight. Uh, hadith is narrated by Abu Musa Al Ashari, radiAllahu anhu, reported that Rasulullah was asked about who fights in the battlefield out of valor, or valor or bravery, or out of zeal or out of hypocrisy, which of them is considered as fighting in the cause of Allah. So he said, he who fights in order that the word of Allah remains supreme is considered as fighting in the cause of Allah. جَاءَ رَجُلٌ إِلَى النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ فَقَالَ الرَّجُلُ الرَّجُلُ يُقَاتِلُ حَمِيَّةً وَيُقَاتِلُ شَجَاعَةً وَيُقَاتِلُ رِيَاءً فَأَيُّ ذَلِكَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ قَالْ مَنْ قَاتَلَ لِتَكُونَ كَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا وَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ right, So this is an example of what we have mentioned earlier where you have one action, right? One action on the outside, this action looks the same. You have multiple people doing all one action. Right? They're, they're raising the sword the same way. Right? They're swinging the sword the same way. Right? They're defending themselves with the sword the same way. The action looks the same. But what is distinguishing these, what seems to be the same action is the intention. So one person is fighting out of shaja'atan, meaning out of because he wants to known, be known as brave. He wants to be known as valiant and brave. Another person is fighting hamiyatan, meaning he's fighting for uh, uh, what they call like um, out, out of um, when a person is asabiyatan, or they're, they're fighting to uh, tribalism, right? Tribalism. So they're tribing, they're fighting to you know to to like like a person fighting today for the flag, right? For the flag of America, defending the flag, right? So you're, they're fighting for their tribe or their country or whatever the reason is. Another person is fighting, huh? Pa yeah, pa patriotism or whatever they want, or tribalism. Right? A person is fighting for this reason, which is what happens many times today. Right? Because a lot of people who are fighting in armies, they don't have any real belief. So they're fighting for the flag, right? Or, you know, to be patriotic. Another person is fighting ri'a'an, to show, right? For show. So a, so a man is coming, he's asking Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which one of them is fighting? In the cause of Allah. So Rasulullah said that whoever fights in order that the word of Allah remains supreme 
is considered as fighting the cause of Allah. In other words, the other, all those who are fighting for any other purpose other than this, then they are not fighting in the path of Allah. All right, so uh, for a person fighting for any other reason besides that the word of Allah remains supreme, then this person uh, is the only person considered to be fighting in the cause of Allah. So a person is fighting just for, uh, to be known as brave, or just for show, or just for tribalism and patriotism, then none of these people are fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only person who is considered to be fighting in the cause of Allah is the one who is doing that. So the word of Allah remains supreme. All right, so this is, uh, we see the concept of, uh, of doing things for show. So as we said, same action. All right, people are doing the same action, but there's completely different intentions. Uh, we had mentioned before, right, what deeds require an intention. And we said that those deeds in which a person, uh, you're not able to distinguish between the, the deeds except by intention, then those deeds require an intention. All right, so this is something uh, where the deed or the action is the same. We have people are fighting for four different intentions, but the action looks the same exact way. So what is it that determines uh, who is getting rewarded versus who is not? It's the intention. All right, so a person who fights for tribalism, right, or a person fights for show, or a person fights for any other reason, they cannot expect their reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have um, a very famous hadith of the first three people who will be thrown into the fire. Anybody knows that hadith? First three people who will be thrown into the fire, be dragged in their face and thrown into the fire. Anybody know? Huh? Okay, so scholar. Some hadith mentions scholar, some of them mention a person who was given Quran, recitation of Quran. Second is the one who's fighting, right? And the third person who was given wealth. All right, person who was given wealth. So the first person is the person who was given uh, either a scholar or some narration mentioned. A uh, person was given Quran, recitation of Quran. So he comes on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, uh, what did you do with that? You know, what, what did you do? And he will say that, you know, I recited for Allah's sake. I recited for Allah's sake. And then Allah will say that, no, you lied. You didn't recite for Allah's sake. Rather, you recited so that people can say that you are a good reciter. And it was said. And then it will be ordered that this person be dragged into the fire. Another person will come with wealth. All right, Allah bless him with wealth and it will be said to them what did, you do? what did you do with the wealth and he will say I spent this wealth in, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it will be said to that person no you lied you didn't spend it in the cause of Allah but rather you, you spent it so that people can say that you are generous you're a generous person and it was said and then afterwards this person will be taken and thrown into the fire and then the third person which is what we're, uh, reason for mentioning this hadith is that a person will be brought he was killed in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he died fighting or claiming to fighting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will be said to him, well, you know, what did you do? He said, I was killed in the battlefield for Allah's sake. And it will be said to him, no, you lied. You, didn't, you, you weren't killed for Allah's sake. You were killed because you wanted people to know you as a brave person. All right? uh, and so it will be told to that person as well that you did this for show and he will be taken and thrown into the fire. All right, so uh, these are the first three people who will be brought on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and thrown into the fire. So anybody who does an action for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, they cannot expect reward to, uh, their reward to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So we have two agreed upon principles that right, anybody we can all agree on, which is number one, that somebody who does good, they should be rewarded. Right? You do something good, you should be rewarded. Right? Whether in this life or not. You do something good, Right, whether it's a good a religious good or something you know, in, in general. Anybody who does something good, they should be rewarded for their good or their ihsan. Right, so that's principle number one, which everyone can agree with. Principle number two is the good doer is not rewarded except by the one who he did it for. Right, so you did something good for somebody else's sake. You cannot expect to be rewarded by anybody else except for that person who you did it for. All right? So a person uh, does something for other than Allah, he cannot expect reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Uh, because you didn't do it for Allah, then how could you expect reward from Allah? All right? So the good doer, even though he should be rewarded, but his reward should only come from the one who he did that action for. All right? So if, like for example, you, you, know, you have a job, you worked, 
you work for an employer, all right, you work for an employer, and then you go to somebody else and you say, well, come, can I, can I have my payment now? So you work for somebody, and then you go to somebody else, and you ask for payment, all right? It doesn't make any sense. You're, you're, you're only entitled to payment for the person who you work for, all right? So you, you did an action, you did an action for Allah, then you can expect Allah to reward you for that action. If you did an action for any other than Allah, then how could you expect Allah to reward you for that action? All right, so this is a simple principle which is agreed upon. How could you expect Allah to reward you if you didn't do something for Allah's sake? All right, so this, therefore, this is the reason why the disbelievers on the on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, they might have done a lot of good deeds in this life. But uh, as Allah says, it will be Haba'a Manthura. It will be just like scattered dust. Why is that? Why will all the deeds of the disbelievers, the good deeds they did, be gone to waste? Because they didn't do it for Allah's sake. So how could you come on Yawm Qiyamah and expect Allah to reward you when you didn't believe in Allah to begin with? Right? So this is the reason why all of the good deeds of disbelievers, whatever they do in this life, the reward they will get is in this life. But on the Yawm Qiyamah, they, won't, they cannot expect to get any reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, so we see in this hadith the, uh, the danger of what we call ar riya Riyah is what well, was turned as showing off. And Rasulullah calls this the uh, shirk al-khafi, the hidden shirk. Right? Because this is something that uh, is uh, very easy to fall into. Right? Very easy to fall into. That you do an action, especially an action that is open in public. And it's very easy to fall into uh, showing off. A person prays, they lengthen their salah a bit extra for people to see, all right? Or a person donates money, and they give money because they want people to know them as generous. And many other examples we can give of uh, this concept of riyah, showing off, all right? Doing, doing deeds for show, and this is, as Rasulullah calls it, a shirk al-khafi, a type of hidden shirk. All right, now also, what we have to be careful of is leaving actions. So we know that doing actions Right, a person goes and they give money only for people to see. All right, they give a donation only for people to see. Right, this is obviously uh, showing off riya, and it is the action will be rejected. Right, but what about somebody who leaves action? Sometimes a person will leave an action. All right, I don't want to do this action because I don't want people to think I'm showing off. Right, so somebody might have that way of thinking as well. All right, so you have money in your pocket. You have twenty dollars. The masjid is asking for donations. I don't want to give this money because I don't want people to think that I'm showing off. So I keep the money in my pocket. Is that something good or no? All right, this is also some, be avoided. Because even though you, you're, 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 you think you're doing it because you don't want people to th say you're showing off, you're actually still doing it for the people. You're actually still doing an action for the people. Right? So either way, whether you do something for, for the people uh, to show off, or you, were, you refrain from doing action, at the end of the day, you're still doing it or not doing it for the people. And this is still considered to be riya. Right? This is still considered to be riya because you are doing it for the people or you're not doing it for the people. But true sincerity is that you don't have any consideration of the people to begin with. I'm going to give this donation and it doesn't matter what, whether a person thinks I'm going to give it for show or, or not, all right? So this is also something very careful of, all right? Uh, leaving actions for the sake of people is also something to be avoided. And there's a very uh, well-known statement of uh, one of the past scholars, Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, عن, who says that, تَرْقُ amal لِأَجْلِ nas riya that leaving actions for the sake of the people, this is riya, this is showing off. You leave some, some action for the sake of the people, this is showing off. وَالْعَمَلُ لِأَجْلِ nas shirk. And doing actions for the sake of people, this is shirk. This is associating partners with Allah. Because now you're doing the action, not for Allah, but for somebody other than Allah. This is what shirk is. Associating partners with Allah. Doing something for Allah and, and for other than Allah. وَالْإِخْلَاسُ أَنْ يُعَافِيَكَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ مِنْهُمَا And ikhlas, true sincerity, is that Allah protects you from both. Allah protects you from both. Allah protects you from doing actions for the sake of people. And Allah also protects you from leaving actions for the sake of people. Don't have the people in mind for anything. Right? Do an action for Allah's sake. Leave an action for Allah's sake. Don't do an action for, uh, for the people. Do not leave an action for the people either. 
Right, so this is the statement of Al Fudayl ibn Iyad. He says, leaving actions for the sake of people is riya. This is showing off. Because why did you leave that action for the people? Right, you didn't want people to say you're showing off. But that, at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're leaving an action for the people. You're not leaving an action for Allah. So whatever you do must be for Allah. Whether you do an action, it must be for Allah. Whether you leave an action, it should also be for Allah. So a person should not uh, be intending to donate, for example. And then they refrain from donating because they don't want people to think they're showing off. Right? This is also a type of showing off. Or I want to make dua. Or I want to offer some voluntary prayers. But I, want, I don't want people to think that I'm showing off. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to offer the prayers. I'm not going to make dua anymore. Because I don't want people to think that I'm showing off. This is a type of showing off as well. Because now you have left an action for the sake of the people. Rather than leaving it for the sake of Allah. So any action must be done for the sake of Allah. Any, ac any action you leave must also be done for the sake of Allah. All right, now when it comes to doing actions, um, the default is that uh, when it comes to obligatory actions, the default is that those should be open. All right, so the, the fara'id, the, 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 the five daily prayers, the fasting Ramadan, hajj, these are meant to be open actions. All right, so the default regarding obligatory actions is that they are meant to be done, done openly. And the default regarding voluntary actions is that they should be uh, done secretly, right? Done secretly. So this is the default. The default regarding uh, obligatory actions is that they're done openly. So this is why we have the five daily salawat. They are, you know, best to perform it in the masjid, right? Openly, all right? Giving zakat, right? Uh, in the time of Rasulullah they used to give it openly, right? So people would come to Rasulullah they would give their zakat, and Rasulullah would pray for them. It's mentioned in the hadith that they would come, uh, and one of the narrators mentioned that his father came and he gave the zakat and Rasulullah prayed for him. Allahumma salli ala Ali ibn Abi, uh, Ali Abi Awfa. This hadith in which Rasulullah was given a zakat to distribute and he prayed for the person who was given the zakat. So the default when it comes to the obligatory actions is that they are done openly. Hajj, right, is done openly. Fasting in Ramadan, we all come, we come to the masjid and everybody knows you know, you know, that everyone is partaking in the fasting. Uh, as for the voluntary actions, and it's best to do those privately, right? Uh, so the Rasulullah when it comes to like the, um, the, the, the prayers, the, the, the non-obligatory prayers, he would pray them in his house. So the, uh, the, the sunan al-ba'diya, the, the sunan that, he, that would come after the salah, the salawat, he would pray those in his house. Now, of course, his house is right next to the masjid. So he could just go, you know, walk, walk to his house and he would pray his sunan. Uh, but for us who live farther away from the masjid, in, 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 in our situation, it might be better to pray in the masjid, to do the, the sunan in the masjid, because if you, you know, wait till you go home, by the time you get home, it will be a different story, right? You might forget or you might get busy. So, but the default is that if, you, if you're able to pray your, your sunan in, in your house, then that is uh, the best thing to do. So when it comes to the voluntary actions, it is better to do those privately, uh, not in the open. All right, now there are certain exceptions. Sometimes a person might uh, do an action because you want others to follow you, right? You want others to follow you in it. So this is not considered to be showing off or riyat, all right? So like, uh, there's like a fundraiser, right? A fundraiser, and you donate, you give a donation openly because you want others to follow you in that and also donate, right? This would not be considered to be showing off. This is a good intention. And Allah says in the Quran, in tubdu sadaqat fin ni'mahi. If you you know if you give sadaqah openly, then this is good. Alright, this is good. Wa in tukfuha wa tuha al-fuqara, but if you conceal it, this is better. Alright, so when it comes to the voluntary charity, it's better to conceal it. But in certain situations, it might be also good to uh, do it openly, as we said, for a person who is doing so, to encourage others to give as well. So you want to encourage others to give, then in that situation, not only might it it's good to do, it might even be better to do it openly uh, as a way of encouraging others to give. Right? But the default is that when it comes to the voluntary actions, you try to do those secretly and not in the open. But the obligatory actions, those are meant to be open. All right? The default for obligations is to be open, right? done openly. The default for voluntary is to be hidden. Al-aslu fil faraid al-i'lam. Wal-aslu fil nawafil al-israr. The default when it comes to obliga ob uh, obligatory actions is that they're done openly. Right, we had the salawat in the masjid, done openly in the masjid. And then the voluntary prayers, you, you, know, you try to do those uh, as much as you can, privately, uh, in your home if you can.
Right? As for the voluntary, then the default is that to be hidden. And in certain situations, then voluntary deeds can be uh, made apparent if there is a uh, reason to do so. All right, any questions on this hadith? All right, moving on. Hadith number nine. Abu Bakr al thaqafi radiallahu anhu, reported the Prophet ﷺ said, when two Muslims confront each other with their swords and one is killed, both are doomed to hell. I said, O Messenger of Allah, as to the one who kills, it is understandable. But why the slain one? He replied, he was eager to kill his opponent. So Rasulullah said that when two Muslims confront each other, right, they're, they're coming to fight, and both are intending to kill each other, both of them are in the fire. So the, they asked Rasulullah, you know, the one who kills, we understand, right? He's the one who killed. We understand why he's going to be in the fire. But why is the one who's killed also, also going to be in the fire? And Rasulullah responded that he was eager to kill his opponent. He had that intention to, even though he was not successful, he had that intention to also kill his fellow Muslim. And because of that intention, he is also uh, punished for that. All right, so both of them are in the hellfire. Both of them are in the hellfire, even though the one who was killed, he didn't have that opportunity to carry out the action, he had the intention. Right, he took the sword, he lifted the sword. He wanted to, to, to commit that action of killing. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him based on his intention, even though he did not uh, actually carry out the deed. All right, and this is, uh, also shows the, the danger of Muslims fighting each other. Rasulullah says in hadith, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ حَمَلَ السِّلَاحَ عَلَيْنَا right, The one who raises weapons, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ حَمَلَ عَلَيْنَا السِّلَاحَ Whoever raises against us weapons is not from us. Right? So it is uh, a major sin for a Muslim to raise his weapon against another Muslim. Even, even in the hadith mentions, even if you're doing so as a joke, right? even, even as a joke, it is prohibited to point your weapon even if you're joking. Even if you're joking. You know, sometimes a person might you know, have a sword and they just point it or a knife and they might just point it as a joke. Rasulullah says even if you do this as a joke, then this is also prohibited. And the, and the hadith mentions that the, the malaika will curse a person who raises a weapon against a believer, even if he's joking. The angels will curse that person until he puts it back down. So pointing a weapon, even if it's just for play or for joke, is prohibited. So much less uh, if a person is intending to harm a, a believer with that, then this is obviously a sinful and a major sin. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَمَا كَانَ لِي مُؤْمِنٍ أَنْ يَقْتُلُ مُؤْمِنًا إِلَّا خَطْعًا That it is not uh, for a believer to ever kill a believer except by accident. Except by accident. Unintentional killing. But killing a believer intentionally, this is a major, major sin. Major, major sin. Alright, now, is this hadith to be taken uh, for all situations? Right, so the hadith mentions that Whenever two Muslims confront each other with a sword, then both of them are in the hellfire. All right, is this hadith to be taken for all situations? What do you guys think? All situations? Yes or no? No. Okay, so there are, there are exceptions. What are the exceptions? Huh? Okay, so this is one exception. Like right? a person who is... Uh, Rebels, right? We we'll, we'll consider rebels. Allah says in the Quran, "In ta'ifatani min al-mu'minin yqtatulu fa aslihu bainahuma." If two groups of Muslims are fighting, then you try to make peace, right, between them. But in baghat ihdahuma ala al-ukhra, but if one of them is transgresses against the other, fa qatilu lati tabghi. Then fight the, the transgressing party, right? So two Muslim parties are uh, groups are fighting, and one of them is transgressing, and you can't make peace between them, and they're insistent on transgressing. Then, فَقَاتِلُ الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيئَ إِلَىٰ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ That Allah says that He orders the, the believers to fight that transgressing group of Muslims. So it's not every situation where Muslims are fighting that this, this hadith applies. Right? So if there's one group of Muslims that are, that are going beyond the bounds and they are transgressing, then it is allowed for the Muslim ruler to raise the sword against them. Right? It is allowed to, for the Muslim ruler to raise the sword against them. If they are transgressing, after he has done his best to try to 
make peace and try to resolve the situation peacefully. But if it's not able to do so, then uh, the sword can be used. Right? Also, if, if, a, if another Muslim comes and tries to attack you, or, or tries to come into your property and take your, your, your wealth, or take your, your house, and you defend yourself, and you end up killing that person, even if he happens to be a believer, this is allowed. Right? This is allowed. If a person, even if they're a Muslim, they come and attack you and you defend yourself, or they attack your family, or they, or they try to take your wealth, and you defend yourself, even if that leads to killing them, then this is allowed, and this does not fall under this hadith. Right? So there are exceptions to this hadith, but this hadith is meant to be applied when Muslims are raising their swords for illegitimate reasons. Right? They had a dispute, a worldly dispute, and now they raise their swords, or in this case, right, their guns to each other, or they fight each other, then this is who... Uh, is, meant, is, be, is being intended in this hadith. All right, so both the killer and the killed person are both in the fire, as Rasulullah well, says in the hadith. All right, but this hadith is not for every qatil. Qatil is the one who kills. The maqtul is the one who is killed. That's for, it's not for everyone. There are exceptions, such as fighting rebels, defending oneself. These will be exceptions. All right, now we have scenarios. Uh, so we have the first scenario in which both are in hellfire. All right, so both are in hellfire. Right, there's another uh, time when both are in hellfire, which is when? So you have uh, two Muslims fighting each other. Also, if two disbelievers fight each other, then they're also both in hellfire, right? Two disbelievers fight each other, then they're both in hellfire. All right, scenario number two. The, one who, the killer, the slayer is in paradise, and the slayed one is in hellfire. How would that apply? Right, so in, 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 the, in, the, in the battlefield, the believer kills a disbeliever in the battlefield. All right, then that believer is in paradise. The one who was killed, the disbeliever, is in hellfire. All right, scenario number three, the slayer, the, the person who, who, who is uh, the killer, he's in hellfire. And the one who's killed, the, slay, the slayed, is in paradise, which would be? All right, so a disbeliever kills a believer. All right, so the disbeliever kills the believer then the disbeliever obviously will be in the hellfire and the believer, he dies as a shaheed, he dies as a martyr and he will be in paradise. Scenario number four, both of them are in paradise. How is that? The killer and the killed, both are in par paradise. How is that possible? All right, possibly. Something else. Both are in, both are in paradise. What? Which are you? Okay, looking for something else though. Looking for something else. Anybody? All right. All right. Let me make it more specific. The, the, the killer is a disbeliever. At the time of the killing. That he later accepts Islam and he, he, and he dies on, on Iman. That he, he goes into paradise. And the one who killed, he killed, died as a, as a martyr and he enters paradise. So both of them end up in a... Uh, entering paradise but this is assuming that one who killed at the time he was a disbeliever later on he accepted Islam and he dies as a believer alright um, so we see in this hadith that um, the one who was killed Rasulullah says he's in the fire even though he did not kill he was killed himself but because he was intending to kill his brother Rasulullah says that he's in the fire so we have five stages of action right five stages of action the first is a passing thought, al-khatir, right? So a thought just comes to your head about committing a sin, right? You have no control over that. The thought just comes to your head, right? This is called al-khatir, passing thought. The next stage is that hadith al-nafs, where it's a passing thought and now you start to, you know, your mind starts to discuss it, right? You start to discuss this action, this sin in your, in your mind, all right? And you start to have an inner dialogue about committing this sin. The next stage is alham. Now you intend to commit this sin. Right? You have an intention to commit this sin. All right? And the fourth is al azam. Now a firm resolve. You firmly resolve to commit this sin. And the final is completing the action. All right? Completing the action. I will finish with this because it's uh, Muslim time. So which one are we held responsible for? We're not accountable for the first three. All right, passing thoughts, inner dialogue, intent, you're not accountable for that. But once you have that firm resolve now to commit that, that sin, this is now where you will be 
accountable. And this is why the Rasulullah says that the one who's killed in this hadith, he is, he is in the fire. He didn't, he didn't kill the other person, but he had that firm intention to kill his brother, and so he is considered to be uh, as if he uh, did the action. So you are responsible, held responsible for number four and five. If you made that firm resolve to commit, commit the sin, and if you complete the action. All right, and we'll uh, end with that for today. Uh, the time for Maghrib has come in. We have some refreshments. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So we have some refreshments in the back. Uh, we we uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward Sister uh, Naz, Auntie Naz, for, complete, uh, for providing uh, the snacks for today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward her and all those who have provided refreshments and snacks in the past. Uh, and with that, Jazakum Allah Khairan, Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wa Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Subhanakallah, Bihamdik, Nashir Allah, Ilaha 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 